New Thinking Aloud is a non-profit endeavor. Your contributions to the New Thinking Aloud Foundation make a meaningful difference in our ability to produce new videos. Thinking Aloud Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we'll be exploring the life and work of the amazing Mexican neuroscientist and paranormal researcher Jacobo Greenberg, who mysteriously disappeared in 1994. My guest is Alex Gomez Marin, a physicist currently employed by the Institute of Neuroscience in Alicante, Spain. He is also the director of the Perry Center in Italy. Alex's research proposal, Seeing Without Eyes, received an award in the Linda G. O'Brien Research Competition sponsored by the Institute of Noetic Sciences. Alex is based in Spain, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Alex. What a pleasure to be with you. This is our third interview. I'm delighted to see you. Thank you, Jeff. Yes, indeed. I'm so happy to talk to you again. We'll be discussing a figure who is very controversial and mostly unknown in terms of the great body of his work, Jacobo or Jacobo Greenberg, the Mexican neuroscientist. As I recall, he got a doctoral degree in the United States, but did his research in, in Mexico, author of 50 books an amazing pioneer when you begin to look at his investigations of shamanism and uh, eyeless sight and uh, extrasensory perception and his theories regarding the uh, relationship of the mind and, and the brain. So, I'm delighted that we're going to be able to share with our English-speaking audience so much that is only available to the Spanish-speaking world. Indeed. And actually, I'm on a little mission here, which is to convey the legacy of Jacobo Greenberg. First, because I have some sort, I feel some sort of affinity with him. I don't know that's, that's something personal, but also I think he deserves it. Plus, as you just said, and hopefully we'll discuss it, he seemed to have lived many lives in one life and he mysteriously disappeared when he was 45. And now 2024 is the 30th anniversary of his disappearing. And so, well, it, it, it just feels timely to say to the world that this extraordinary man existed and to tell a bit of what he did and what he wrote and what, what he found and what he experienced. It's, it's a fascinating life indeed. His career is so varied. I suppose a good starting point is your specialty of neuroscience. Jacobo was, amongst everything, a scientist, but he went into all those directions working with shamans and, and also he was a theoretician at the same time. He was doing experiments in the lab. So it's like he has many legs. We could talk about the theory, which I think is the most important aspect, if you would ask him, his synthetic theory. But also in the lab, he was doing pioneer experiments in the 70s, maybe the 80s, until 94 when he disappeared. And so one thing he was doing, they were doing in the lab, they were studying hemispheric coherence. And his lab had, had the title Human Communication. So they were trying to see what happens in certain meditative states and what happens in the brain and whether there's coherence amongst the hemispheres. But then they were also testing two people and how both brains would align with each other, would influence each other. And then he went further. And that was actually the last experiment he did before he disappeared. And he was inspired by the EPR, Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen experiment, you know, or the, this, this thought experiment. So his final experiment was taking these people that were in interaction, close interaction in the same room, let's say, like the electrons in physics put them aside in, in Faraday cages and then 
stimulate with some very simple visual stimulus in, in, in one case, one of the subjects, and then try to detect if this um, evoked potential in one subject was transferred to the second subject, and he called this the, the transferred potential. And it wasn't telepathy per se, but it was like neurobiological basis of non-local communication detected in human brains. And I understand he performed maybe 50 or 60 experiments of this type with consistent results. Yes, and, and of course the results need to be replicated, and I think they have been replicated. I know, for instance, Dean Radin has, has published something along those lines, and I know Peter, Peter Fenwick also tried to replicate them, and sometimes he couldn't, and then he could. This goes also back, and probably Jacobo didn't know about this. I always wonder if what they could read then, what they knew, also because I don't think he was very fluent in English. And there wasn't a lot of research, but actually there's some classic papers from 1965, if I recall correctly, a very brief paper in science about some twins and, and some recordings. So it was really hard to record then. I mean, the, the, the technology we have today would sound like science fiction to them, but they were already into it. They were doing it in the lab. They had these ideas. They were getting positive results. I must admit that you could critique the methodology and, you know, could have been done better. But he was an absolute pioneer, again, both in terms of the theoretical framing and vision and also the courage to go in the lab in Mexico in the 80s and just go for that. And, and, and today... Even today, it sounds pioneering. So imagine 30, 35 years ago. Long ago, I interviewed Carl Prebram, the neuroscientist who was then at Stanford University and uh, had developed a model of brain functioning. He called it the holographic brain. Uh, he had uh, very interesting theories. And I know that he took Greenberg quite seriously. He went to uh, Mexico and visited Greenberg's laboratory. I think he was impressed with what he saw. He, he only hoped there would be more replications in other labs. Yes, yes, it makes total sense. And, and Jacobo set up his lab and also an institute that he called INPEC. And this stands for Instituto Nacional para el Estudio de la Consciencia, National Institute for the Study of Consciousness. And yes, well-known people would, would ring him and then travel to Mexico and discuss with him and be surprised about what was going on. If only, uh, if only he had had more years to just develop um, his, his experiments and his theory, which was always in construction. By the way, before he disappeared, they had planned an experiment to try this transfer potential, not between two people separated by a few meters in Mexico, but actually one in India or Tibet, if I recall correctly, and another one in Mexico to provide some more evidence about the true non-locality, the irrelevance of space in doing that. But to, to your comment and your question, he was known by other figures like Castañeda, Carlos Castañeda. And so he was very popular back then. And then he disappeared. And the sad thing is that people forgot. People forgot about him. I would dare to say, even in, in his homeland, even in Mexico, he has been forgotten until quite recently. So now we are experiencing kind of a revival of, of, of Greenberg. Well, I know there's a movie, a documentary that has been made. I think it largely focuses on the mystery of his his disappearance. That has become somewhat sensationalized in, in the media because of his prominence in the scientific world and particularly his interest in parapsychology and, and the fact that uh, he apparently disappeared without a trace. I agree. And I watched the movie, I watched the documentary, it's called El Secreto del Dr. Greenberg, The Secret of Dr. Greenberg. I also realized that the film director, whose name is Ida Cuellar, was born in Barcelona, like myself. So I found his contact and I contacted him. He's a wonderful man, also very knowledgeable about, I could say, all these mysteries, not in a sensationalist way, 
and, and so I have a good relationship with Ida. This documentary has kind of two sides, right? One is that, of course, it, it sells, what it sells, what it presents is the thriller, right? The mystery of what happened to this man. And it could have been a scientist, it could have been somebody else, right? But it's, it's really shocking how he vanished and then there's some clues that he could have some ties to the CIA. All the people say, said he was maybe killed by, by, by his current wife there because she also disappeared but was found somewhere. All the people said he just vanished into hyperspace meditating. So there's a whole kind of culture and cult behind it. Now, the documentary presented that, I would say, pretty well. Now, it had the excuse then to introduce to the world, or at least to the listeners, the science, the fascinating science he was doing. That wasn't, that wasn't the main goal of the documentary, but this has created, as I was saying, at least in me, spurred tremendously the curiosity of who's this man, regardless of actually what's a tragic happening, right? Because, well, I, I then got in contact with, with his daughter, Estusha, with whom I, you know, I, I chat sometimes, and it's the disappearing of a father. You see, I, I, out of out of out of the blue, he's gone, and also I know I know his first wife, Lisette, and and she's absolutely l lovely. And so this is a, a tragic happening. Some people are stuck with it because they cannot stop speculating about where whether he's still alive, where he would be, and so on. And then my goal is just to honor his legacy and, and bring it to the, to the foreground and, and, and see if we can continue working on his theory. So the, all these aspects, it's a very complicated constellation, Jeff, because it's, it's irresistible. It's like there, there's evidence in the documentary. And by the way, the, the film director, Ida, I think it took him eight or nine years to record it. He was going to Mexico, and then he also found the, the police officer who was in charge of the case, and he it was really hard to find, and he found him, and then he showed him uh, some more pieces of data. So the documentary also kind of moved forward in the understanding of what happened. At the end of the day, we don't know. And, well, for the good and for the bad, this has opened the Greenberg Pandora box in Mexico, and I would wish that the Anglo-American world would know about this man both kind of the listeners your audience but also the more orthodox neuroscientists today given that theories of consciousness is on the table and there are dozens of them right so Jacobo's synthetic theory deserves a little spot there and uh, who knows I think it has some merit some really really important merits theoretically because if we have time to discuss it maybe later it brings in together notions of space and physics with neuroscience. And, well, I'm a physicist or neuroscientist, so this is even more interesting to me that somebody tried to bridge these worlds like that. Well, I think his theory is quite significant if, uh, to the extent that I understand it. He seemed to be positing that, that consciousness itself is outside of space and time, but somehow the brain is able to interact with this, what you might call the non-local domain. Yes, yes. He wasn't a physicist, and I think he admitted that he wasn't really good with maths, but he had a I mean, I've, I've gone so deeply into his work and reading his books and so on that I try to imagine. That's something that's mesmerizing. So I try to imagine how he dealt with that. So he had this tremendous imagination, which doesn't mean making things up or fiction. I think he was absolutely creative. And so despite not knowing the maths, he grasped that there's something very puzzling about space, about the phenomenology of it. And he writes pages and pages in different books about, you know, I'm looking at the moon here and I get the rays of the moon. But then if I shift to a little bit to the side, I, I still get them. So he starts making this theoretical, philosophical digressions about, well, it seems like the space can contain information at all these different points about another object. So it has a smell of holographic theory a la Pribram too. 
And so once he has this in place, and actually it takes him quite a few years, and you can see it if you trace the, onto the ontogeny, the development of his theory in his own writing, because he was really work on the construction. Then he says, well, on the one hand, we have the organization of space, which we should not take for granted. So that's the physics part of it. And on the other hand, of course, we have the brain and we have these neuronal fields that the brain creates. And so he puts them together and he says it is the interaction between space and its organization and this neuronal field that gives rise to, and, and we could qualify this later because it's complicated, but that gives rise to experience. Basically, and he said it very clearly, all his life was an exploration of the question, where does experience come from? And the way he theoretically frame it is by bringing together these neural fields and this organization of space, and then he called it the lattice. So it's like the, the space in its purest form that then gets distorted. And so that those distortions are what give rise to physical things, objects, and so on. And it is this interaction that gives rise to experience but later on, he added more elements, maybe if you wish some more mystical elements, saying, well, that's not enough. We need some sort of observer, capital O. And, and so that brought his work, led it into the meditation aspect of it, or the more mystical. And he drew from, from Jewish mysticism and from the local shamans in Mexico. So he drew from all these traditions from the best he could about quantum physics and space and from what he had learned in his stay in New York about neuroscience and, and blend it all together into his theory. It's very interesting. I, I, I am Jewish myself, so I have some appreciation for uh, the Kabbalah, the mystical uh, traditions of Judaism. And I understand that Greenberg, before he even became a neuroscientist, went and spent a year or two living in Israel and visiting the village of Safed, which is considered the heart of, of the uh, Kabbalistic tradition going back to medieval times. Oh, you're saying this, Jeff, and it gives me shivers because I, I read his some sort of autobiography, which he wrote kind of halfway through. <laughs> but at some point, he was writing books like like crazy. I mean, in, in, in 20, about 20 years, he wrote more than 40 books, maybe 50, plus, plus the laboratory research, plus all his adventures that maybe we can discuss later. And, and in his autobiography... He explains when he was so young and he went to this kibbutz that there's where he met his first wife, Lisette. And, and also there in Israel, he, he experienced the first, we'd call it, we could say it because sometimes I'm shy, but with you, I shouldn't, of course, this paranormal or, or weird phenomena started to happen, it happened there. And he was super surprised because he had like this inquisitive proto-scientist mind. And so there was something about a watch stopping and then he met, he met some some very interesting people so i think that experience in israel and um, plus what he inherited from his family interestingly i think it was his his dad or his granddad that that came to the to the us and he ex tells the story in the autobiography he had a really strange maybe polish um, surname sorry i forgot and the 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 guy at at the customs let's say couldn't couldn't transcribe it. And he said, no, uh, that name, no. Okay, just we'll call you Greenberg. So even the surname has this kind of profound uh, uh, anecdotal aspect of, of his life. And so, yes, it was in, in, in a way this trip to Israel that many things um, started happening to him. And throughout his work, he's always, yes, going back to, to, his, to his tradition. Also, he has other books, which are some sort of, I put it this way, galactic autobiographies, because he has kind of this, this Earth's biography. But then in other books, he seems to be writing about his previous lives. And of course, in some of them, um, yes, he, he's in all these times that have to do with, yeah, with different traditions in India and, and in Israel and in Russia, if I recall correctly. And then he has another sort of biography or autobiography where he describes his life in another planet and that he's sent to earth as a kind of a punishment. So his universe was filled with past and present, different lives, different cultures, and, and he could hold it all, all together in, in one body.
As I recall the story you briefly alluded to about the watch stopping, if I remember rightly, it occurred when he was in Israel, he encountered a group of spiritualists and they held seances. And in one of these seances, a, a spirit entity came through and told him that at a certain hour, like, I don't know, 3 a.m. that evening, his watch was going to stop. And, and that, in fact, happened to the second. Yes, yes. And that was one of the many more incredible, impossible, I would say, impossible things that happened to him later. And in a way, he was looking for them, but those things also came to him. And a great example, I would say the major example is his work with Pachita, who was this healer, um, this old lady dressed like, like, you know, a person from the street, a normal low Malay people. And she, you know, she would receive countless of people in her house, mostly at night. And she had this knife, this old rusty knife. And with it and her own hands, she would do all sorts of impossible surgery and, and not even that. And you could say, of course, and you probably have interviewed people who claim to do this or who have even pre presenced those psychic healing experiences where they say it's trickery and so on. But there were like hundreds, if not thousands of people who came to see Pachita and she would materialize, <laughs> it's hard for me to even say, but organs and put them back, uh, total impossibility. And for some reason, Pachita told Jacobo, you stay here with me, you're my helper and you take notes, you just, you just mm, report what you see. And then, and I've talked about this with, with Lisette, his first wife, and she recalls, can you imagine, Jeff, like you're in the lab during the day doing your EG or whatever, your recordings, you're writing books, but then at night you go to this place and you come back home covered in blood and sweat and all the rest, having presents night after night, impossible things, and then you write about it. And actually, Jacobo wrote seven volumes called Los Chamanes de Mexico. And he told what he saw. It's like a pretty pretty impressive um, anthropological work on the, 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 what was going on with many shamans in Mexico. So that was another kind of side career of his, like this, this reporting of what happened, which, by the way, fit really well into his synthetic theory. So it was... He wasn't trying so much to refute it, but it was self-validation. It's like, okay, this is, he comes back home, couldn't believe what he saw, but he saw it. But at the same time, it had a place under his theory, which was his, his main, main occupation to answer that question, where does experience come from? Now, if I understand correctly, Doña Pachita uh, became his guru in effect his teacher, and she seemed to demonstrate over and over again what you might think of as a mastery of time and space, causing objects to apport, to appear out of nowhere, or to disappear. And uh, similarly with the healings that she performed, and he witnessed this over and over and over again. And he concluded that she had access to a level of reality, the non-physical level of reality. You could call it the reality of quantum potential, I suppose. And, uh, and he believed that the whole physical universe emerged out of that reality so that if one could access that level of re reality consciously, then one could exhibit control and magical ways over physical phenomena. Totally. And again, Jeff, sometimes I believe this is utter nonsense and impossible. But at the same time, the more things I read and I hear, well, this, for instance, I relate it in a moment to the UAP phenomenon that, I, that I'm really a, a newcomer in, in terms of just paying attention, let's put it this way. But back to Pachita. So she would do those things with eyes closed. So apparently there was already extraocular vision going on there. But of course, she was going beyond just extrasensory perception and so on. The real deal there was like, well, doing 
physical things, materializing things. And back to Jacobo's theory. So there is this thing called the lattice, which is like the fundamental kind of structure of space that in these interactions with the neuronal field, which by the way also comes from the lattice, so it's, it's, a, bit, it's a bit complicated. But anyways, it, these torsions and distortions of the lattice are what manifest what we see as physical reality. So according to Jacobo, Pachita would have a, a capacity, a neural capacity, if you wish, that, that she could create distortions and distortions, and then through these interactions, she could materialize objects. Now, uh, he then went back to the lab, and there's one paper, and this was a paper that came out from the Freedom Information Act, and also that's why people say, well, he had ties with the CIA. That doesn't mean that. That just means that the CIA was interested in, in this kind of research. But there's a paper from 1983, I think, or 92, on, on bio bioenergetics, one journal that doesn't exist anymore. I, I, I got the paper, and he even tried to weight something on a scale in a lab, and then just see if he could, he could measure changes in weight uh, according to these you know, torsions and distortions of space-time. This hasn't been replicated, and it will be, it will be really, really incredible if this could be shown in a lab. But at the same time, you know, you've recently talked to Carlos Eire, for instance, when he, when he speaks about what the saints were doing when they were levitating, and, and these aspects about anti-gravity or maybe you know, suspension of some laws, and, and that also has to do with um, aspirations that, that the technological industry may have. So again, all of that is in, in, that, in those nights that Jacobo spent, spent with Pachita. And by the way, Pachita said, well, he didn't recall what happened, but it was the spirit of Cuauhtémoc, who was one of the, the if I recall correct, correctly, the great Aztecs, um, Aztec um, gods, right? So she could even say who was coming. And the remarkable thing was that Jacobo wa- remained skeptical, but continued to go night after night and just reported what he saw with his own eyes. So that's remarkable of him. I wouldn't say he just believed everything he saw, but he kept on going uh, until those visits stopped. I gather he also uh, engaged in rituals and uh, as well as the use of hallucinogenics or entheogenics. Well, he has a, you know, we tend to tell the laboratory st- research and also this more anthropological work on the books. But in, in, in that biography I was mentioning, I have it right here. Yeah, it, I, I was putting the names. It's this one, La Conquista del Templo. And by the way, some of those books are, I know now, that are going to be published in, in, in a main publishing house and hopefully translated to English. So in, in this bi- biography, he explains he went to New York and then in New York he was doing his Research, but then he went back, and then he um, rented a, a hut somewhere on the outskirts of, of Mexico, of, of Mexico D.C. And there he was, he was spending time with with his daughter. But then he would spend also weeks, just yes, just meeting strange people from the mountains, and then exploring their own minds and meditating really, really deeply. So. He was an, a true explorer of consciousness. You see, not only theory, and a theory that's not, by the way, it's just some metaphor that comes to mind on Tuesday and on, on Thursday I have my own theory. No, for many years he's working on that. He has the laboratory work, he does all this field work, and on top of it, he cultivates his own experience. And, and so, it, it's, to me, it's an example, even if you don't want to imitate or copy what he was doing, of the elements that the future scientist shall, shall possess, right? Explorer of consciousness, um, avid reader, great writer, unafraid to be in the presence of impossible things. But yes, those times and those experiences, perhaps at some point they were more important to him and to his development than what he could find in the lab. I don't know. I think he was also instrumental in helping to reawaken in Mexico an appreciation of their indigenous culture, which was 
really uh, very highly evolved. Absolutely. And these seven volumes of the Shamans of Mexico, it's, it's uh, also a homage to, to what's an intrinsic part of Mexico. And that's also interesting. Different countries have their legacy, their traditions. And, and to many Mexicans, and I'm started to meet more and more of them because I'm also in contact with, with, with Jacobo's former students, who are now 50 years old or 50 something, they were 20 something. To, to the lo local population, they, they, or they, their, their parents and their grandparents maybe had contact with these curanderos. And this is fascinating. Like, of course, if you pretend you're like a 21st century civilized man, you would say, well, I don't know. But it was, it's natural to, for them to recall that somebody said or somebody saw that one of these shamans was stopping the rain, another one could communicate with spirits, another one was, you know, dealing with the sacred plants and, and so on. It's pretty real. It's as real as it gets. It's just that if we study it from our own abstracted and decontextualized perspective, we might just dismiss it. But yes, I think he did a great service to, to the legacy of, of his own country. I understand, for example, that, that he was an observant Jew and that on the Jewish high holiday of Yom Kippur, where, where Jewish people typically fast the entire day, instead of going into the synagogue and praying with the other Jews, and there was a strong Jewish community in Mexico, he would go up to the Pyramid of the Sun at Teotihuacan and climb to the top of the pyramid and sit at the apex of the of the pyramid in meditation all day long. Yes, and, and probably he was getting into some really interesting states. And that's, he was a free soul, you see, and, and a seeker. And, and that's, by the way, why it took some weeks even to realize he had, he had disappeared. So this gives also a sense of how much here and there he was and how free, because he could do that for a few weeks and maybe he wasn't coming to the lab and the students would say, well, or his family, well, he'll be somewhere doing one of those things. And then he appeared again and, and no problem. He, and some of the students told me as well that on Thursdays, there was this sign on the, on the, on the door that said, well, on Sundays, they, they're not there because they were all together meditating somewhere else. So can you imagine a laboratory today where... The very students are invited to just go and explore the, the, their inner worlds with the, the head of the lab. And, well, it's, I suppose, being a, a co-worker with him, because he's also, people say he had a strong temperament. So perhaps it wasn't easy to be around him. They also say he was often absorbed looking into other places, you know, so... I'm not sure how easy it would have been to, to be around him, but he was this magnetic, magnetic figure that, yes, that was all over the place. Well, you are, uh, to my understanding, the director of a division in a neuroscience laboratory yourself. What, what would occur if you uh, to told your coworkers and students, uh, we're going to go out into the country and meditate together today? Would, would that be tolerated in, in your laboratory? Well, it would be tolerated on weekends because, you know, on weekends you're allowed to have your hobbies. Um... I guess we have freedom. I shouldn't complain. We have freedom. But I think the interesting thing is not only to do it on a Thursday, is that, that what you experience in this meditation then was fed back into the laboratory work. And he, for instance, Jacobo had this, in, in his theory, he speaks about orbitals, which is inspired by the, the quantum jumps, you know, like the, 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 this, you can be at this uh, orbital level and then you need to have this this discrete leap to another one. So we speak about these orbitals of consciousness and, and how you could go up and down them. Or also he wrote a book about his particular technique of meditation. And in it, he, he, he emphasizes awareness of the body and then awareness of, of all your thoughts and so on, which sounds pretty topical today. But 
This is also what allowed him to realize that this interaction between the space and the neuronal field required kind of an observer that was beyond those. And, and so there's a continuous exchange between crazy occurrences, people, people he, meet, he meets, um, laboratory results. For instance, th- some of those shamans he invited into the lab. And he was one of the first people to have you know, meditators, real deal meditators and shamans and measure their, their neural activity and discover that they seem to have like pretty, pretty coherent structure that was, you know, extraordinary as well as their capacities. And, and then other people did it in other labs. But you see, he was able to spend days in the jungle and also convince some of those people to come to the lab and, and wear the technology. Well, it's often said that there's a fine line between genius and insanity. And I gather that uh, some of his critics thought maybe he had crossed that line, that uh, he was behaving in uh, erratic ways that suggested to some people that he was uh, perhaps experiencing a bipolar disorder or some other form of mental illness. Uh, Have you been able to make an assessment of that yourself? Not really. I, I, I don't blame, in a way, I don't blame those, those colleagues who would be appalled, perhaps. Because if you're doing classic psychology or classic neurophysiology in Mexico in the 80s, and here you have a man who seems to come from, you know, 50 years ahead in the future, just working by your side, and, and you start hearing that he's doing all of those things, it's, it's, yeah, it's hard to swallow that that's your colleague. And so I, I think he experienced the usual, you know, um, taboos and, and pressures and so on. Now, I can also imagine, as I was telling you, that, that he was a complicated man. He was a complicated man and he knew exactly what he wanted to do. So he couldn't care less. He would do it anyways, one way or another. And yes, that's bordering on genius, and geniuses are are difficult people in a way. But at the same time, at least the the, the the students that I've met that he had have great memories of him, like like being fascinated by by having him around, and they felt really orphaned when he disappeared. And by the way, he disappeared. It took some months to really realize that he had disappeared. And the moment he disappeared, and that's another sad thing, people from the university just took the equipment and they dismantled everything. And it's like as if nothing had happened. So this has been, it's been kind of in, in spore mode for many years. And now it's coming back. And I think now at the University of Mexico, Universidad Nacional Autónoma de Mexico and other places, they would start to feel proud of him. Whereas maybe 30 or 35 years ago, they were ashamed. And so that's another mark of a pioneer in the house that many decades go by and they realize, wow, turns out that we had a great figure here and we didn't know. He was a rare person to be able to combine the scientific training and neuroscience with a deep uh, participatory interest in shamanism. Uh, people like that are very rare. Maybe uh, in some ways you may come close to to uh, f- filling his footsteps. Well, yeah, that, that would be a, that would be an honor in any way. But but yes, they. They or we, and I include you. We we've experienced something, we've sensed something, we, and we go after it in a way, whatever it takes. And and then the journey can be harsh, but it's also fascinating because you 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 find those things along the way and and extreme curiosity and and so I think yeah, he lived forty five years until he disappeared. And well, what a life! What a life he he lived. Um as an academic, as an explorer, as a father, as a lover. Yeah, he tells many stories about yeah, being easily, easily falling in love. So a very polyethnic character and perhaps not everybody. We couldn't, we couldn't live in a world where everybody is Jacobo Greenberg, right? But we're, we're lucky to have those people and whose, whose influence 
still ripples many decades later. And I believe, and I'm also working towards it, but I believe that people will just do archaeology on his work and, and realize what a gift he donated to Mexico and the Spanish-speaking world. Because, by the way, not sure, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm Spaniard, as you know, and speaking in another language, speaking in English, thinking in English is great. And yet there's some things I feel we can only, only think or properly experience even in Spanish and perhaps the same in, in English or in Hebrew and so on. And so this is also a call to the Latin American community. And I've met people, for instance, in, in Buenos Aires and in Mendoza, and they have like master degrees where they bring shamans. And it, there's this tradition all in all these speaking English, Spanish-speaking countries, where all these edges of consciousness we've discussed before are are very normal, are are still alive, and it's invaluable because then we're talking about what people already know and experience and feel, and and they can help us to to do a better science of those anomalous experiences with that, which are part of their of the fabric of the country. It does seem to me uh, from my limited travels that in the English speaking world, we've been much more successful in suppressing our uh, interests in the paranormal. And whereas in the uh, Latin countries, the uh, paranormal is much closer to the surface. Yes, yes. That's my impression too, especially yeah, in Latin America, not so much in Spain. Although, for instance, Jacobo did a trip to Spain the beginning of the 90s and appeared this is the rare f f footage that we have of him speaking there's not a lot of him but there are two tv programs spanish tv of incredible programs in a way they remind me of of your work jeff because these were like open open-minded and yet rigorous they were bringing all these great figures from the time and they flew jacobo and they record him and he, you can watch it online. It's very impressive, and and they're all there smoking in the in the TV set. And and he did a tour in Spain. And another thing that's synchronistic, at least for me, is that I now speak to people, and quite more often than not, they say, um, "Well, actually, I met, I had dinner with Jacobo when he was touring in Spain." Or another, the other day, somebody who you know, who's a who's a researcher of consciousness, told me that he had also coincided with Jacobo when he was in New York in that laboratory. So there are many unexpected ties among all of all of us there. And so I also have a sense of community. You know, this is beautiful to me as well, to feel that there's a community and your, your new thinking aloud is also like a great gateway to know that there are more people there. And then there are those who are still not with us, but they are with us in a way. And there's a sense of familiarity, at least for me, with Jacobo's work. And yeah, I feel he, he accompanies what I'm doing. By the way, all these um, investigations on extraocular vision that we've discussed um, before in another, in another installment of yours, it they came from, to me, by reading his theory and then realizing that he was also, you know, spending time investigating that phenomenon. So it's a, it's a very fruitful, it's a very fruitful tree. It has many, many, and many fruits, and you can pick the one you prefer and enjoy it. Well, yes, we, we could pick uh, his interest in uh, in theogens, or his interest in shamanism, his interest in space and time, his theoretical work, or his laboratory work, and. Uh, of all of those, it seems to me that uh, it's fair to say that the laboratory work has progressed since his death, that his key insight seemed to be that we could look at physiological measures and uh, show that they uh, correlate with uh, various forms of uh, paranormal communication. And, and now there is a wide range of experiments uh, supporting that. It, it's still controversial, of course, simply because it, it contradicts the uh, mainstream paradigm, the materialistic paradigm that we've talked about. But, but I would say the number of independent laboratory replications, I just read one 
uh, recently about working with stock traders and showing that uh, stock traders who are more aware of their internal physiology uh, are uh, more profitable. Than, than those who are not, suggesting that, that the body is able to pick up signals from the future. This remark is really important. Thanks for making it, Jeff, because it allows me to, to stress something where Jacobo was also very fine-tuned, because you can say, well, this, all of this goes beyond the brain, and it does, beyond the brain, so beyond that you forget you have a brain. Some people say, no, it's, everything is in the brain and those things don't exist and so on. Well, Jacobo took the best of both worlds because, yes, all of this is crazily beyond the brain. And at the same time, he was still one of the very few neuroscientists who took the pains to go and look in the brain for correlates of, of those incredible phenomena. And he found some. So I think there's also a future path for neuroscience and there are recent results coming as as, as you may know, this recent work by, by Maurice Friedman, for instance, and so on, of people who have the means and the training to look at how the brain may be inhibiting, for instance, these this latent powers we have. And just, it's beautiful, breaching both worlds. So what I'm trying to say is you don't need to reject the whole edifice of neuroscience. You could put it to your service and learn more about what's still a mystery, right? About... Yes, what's going on with space and with time and with perception when, when these things happen, but they must happen also in a physical body. That, and so we have brains and, and we have flesh. And, and so put, to put mind and matter together from this perspective, I think it's, it's totally, totally exciting. Well, Alex Gomez Marin, once again, a fascinating discussion about a fascinating individual. And I'm hopeful that our conversation will reawaken interest in the neuroscience community and particularly the English speaking neuroscience world to reinvestigate the findings of Greenberg, especially in light of uh, the findings of many other people, such as Morris Friedman, whom you've just mentioned, and who I'm hoping to have as a guest soon on New Thinking Aloud, incidentally. There's so much research going on in, in the neuroscience field. Uh, uh, it definitely deserves a, a, a careful look. Uh, it's hard to stay on top of. Well, thank you for again holding this space, uh, this platform, and for allowing me to talk about Jacobo. I'm grateful, and I think Jacobo is happy that, you know, through New Thinking Aloud, now many English speaking people can know that he did such things and they can f try to find some of his English work. There's at least one book, if not two or three, that, been, that have been translated and a few scientific articles and all the popular media stuff out there. So thank you, Jeff, for making this possible as a vehicle. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, Alex. I hope we have many more conversations. And for those of you watching or listening to New Thinking Aloud, thank you for being with us because you are the reason that we are here. I imagine that by now, many of you already realize that in conjunction with White Crow Books, we've just launched the new Thinking Aloud Dialogues book imprint, and our first title is, Is There Life After Death? New Thinking Aloud is a non-profit endeavor. Your contributions to the New Thinking Aloud Foundation make a meaningful difference in our ability to produce new videos.